My, my name is Dan Wilkins. I work for the town. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm the director of public works and engineering for the town. We're actually live streaming our presentation tonight. We're trying to figure out if uh, we need to use the microphones or not in order for the live stream to work properly. I think you need to be close. I think you need to be a little closer to our mic. Or we can pull one around. Okay. So maybe I'll stand over here closer to a mic, make sure. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Is that working okay? Yeah. All right. So I'll stand back here, hide behind the table. <laughs> the. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is an update on our West River Streetscape project. I know a lot of you came for a similar meeting about a year ago and then things stalled out with the project. Uh, we did maintain forward momentum, but when we met a year ago, our plan at that time was to have uh, brought an assessment district vote to you all as the property owners last fall. We ended up not doing that because of a couple of reasons. One, we were finalizing some stuff with the railroad, and we actually have a couple folks that work for the railroad here that have been very helpful to us. Um, one of the things we were trying to do is buy land from the railroad. We don't actually own the land, but we were buying easements from the railroad. And being able to get those easements in the town's control were, was very important to being able to make sure the project was going to work. So we, we slowed down on the assessment district. We were in fact able to acquire the easements from the railroad, so that's done. The land uh, access that's needed for the prop project to be successful has been secured. And then, uh, and then we were busy with other things and COVID was slowing the world down. So things have dragged out longer than we had hoped, but we're getting things back on track now. So, um, and I'll, I'll, we'll dig into those details a little more. What I'd like to do is maybe go through and do introductions uh, of everyone in the room. So I'm, again, I'm Dan Wilkins. I'm the director of public works and engineering. I've worked for the town for 24 years now. So I've been involved with a lot of the uh, like the trails that have been built and the roundabouts and some of the downtown sidewalk projects and the sidewalk project over in front of the Truckee Donner PUD that happened a few years ago. Um, so we've got uh, some background in doing work similar to this, the Brickletown streetscape project that happened a few years ago. So we had some other areas of town that got to be the guinea pigs for what will hopefully be a successful project for you all on West River Street. I'll go over to Jessica here. Hi, I'm Jessica Thompson, and I'm the project manager for this. And um, I've talked to many of you because I've been bugging you and meeting with you on site and things like that. Microphone. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, Jessica Thompson. <laughs> and um, so uh, I will be in contact with you for the entire project. So I'm always available to talk if you need to. And Jessica lives in Sierra Meadows. So she's. All this stuff we're going to talk about in a minute, she's going to be using all the time as a resident of Truckee. So she's <laughs> trying to make sure it's I done. I want it done just as much as you guys do. Yeah, she wants it done properly. So uh, so it will go through the room. I'll pick on Becky first. OK, I'm Becky Buclar. I'm an engineering manager at town and um, just providing a little assistance to Jessica. And then I'll go to Michelle. I'm Michelle Campbell with Lewis and Associates, and we're the design consultant. And then Jason. Jason Tokheim, also Loomis and Associates, civil engineer. And Nola. I'm Nola Mitchell. I'm new with the town of Truckee. I'm an associate engineer. Yeah, and Nola, Nola will be helping out with this project too, so you'll be seeing her. So that's the, the folks on the town side that are kind of working on this on a day to day basis. Now I'd like to make uh, all of you folks that took your time to come and be with us tonight introduce yourselves. Joe McGinnity, property owner. Shelly McGinnity. I'm with him. Yeah. <laughs> Beth. Beth Christman. I'm with him. Jim yeah. Hurstman, property owner. Yeah. I'm Carolyn Scott, property owner. And then uh, maybe you can mention which saying, properties yeah, exactly. you own. So Joe, you own the Garden Folly. Garden Folly. Garden Folly building. Uh, 10141 West River, the little red schoolhouse. And you guys live there, right? No. Oh, you don't. Okay. 
Uh, then which property? We own 10075, so that's Lux, Harris Lawn, and the real estate building. Got it, okay. And then? Uh, Michael Ranieri, 10150, A and B, the, the two warehouses. Okay, so you're the, on the north side of the street? Correct. Okay, yep. Michael's on Fania, uh, my wife Amy's on Fania. We own the Cornerstone Bakery and the Morgan's Lobster Shack. Used to be there, building also. Yeah, and Bill? Bill Kenny and Nancy Costello, 10145 West River Street, right next to the Garden Folly. And you guys are living there? Yes. Yeah. And then Mike? Michael Upton, uh, Union Pacific Railroad. I also reside during specific times when our operations at 10. Okay, so the railroad house, you live there Sometimes. from time to time. Yep. Yeah. Whenever you're on bad terms with the wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris Martinez, uh, lived here my whole life, 30 years, and uh, worked for Union Pacific and just like to be involved with what's going on there. Are you related to Jesse and Octavio? Yeah, my oldest brother. Oh, that's what I thought. I saw the resemblance. Yeah. Chris's brother works in the public works department for the town. Uh, I'm Brian Murphy. I own uh, uh, 10095 West River with uh, the sports hub is. And then we also lease the building the station from the Got it. And we'll kick back over to this side of the room. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, J.D. Benna. I own the Crap Shack, uh, the larger one uh, in there, um, 10187, and then I own the two vacant lots, 10175 and 67. So these are the properties down... Towards the end there, yeah. Towards the west end of the project, kind of, kind of near Mill Street, that yeah, zone. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we've been working on the, uh, the Victorian for about three years historical it's a class a structure so it's been a little challenging but lucky, lucky you yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right cool uh jd my wife uh we have 10055 west river street which is jd hoss harwoods and carpets we own the building and operate our business out of there so right thank and you workforce housing yes above. that's a multi-use so we put workforce housing in the building too oh good cool great uh did we miss anyone no? Great. Yeah, again, thanks for your time. Um, so the purpose of today's meeting, we wanted to give you an update on the Streetscape project. We've, we're have we reestablishing momentum on it right now. Like I mentioned, we lost a little bit of momentum last winter, but it didn't mean things weren't happening. And uh, one of the things that's been happening is the design work that we had talked about last year one of the things we wanted to do was meet with different property owners, figure out exactly how this project could interface with your property and try to do that as, uh, in a way that's complementary to your property. So a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings have happened since then. And we've uh, done our best to incorporate you know, what we heard from you all as property owners in those meetings into the project design to try to make things work. You know, We've always got to make sure things line up at the property line because uh, sometimes you know one property owner may have uh, something different in mind than their neighbor and we're always trying to blend that and come up with uh, with the best balance uh, we wanted to talk about the updated schedule on the assessment district and uh, overall schedule on the project talk a little bit about the fact that a lot of this project in order to implement it we would need to get permission from you as property owners to uh, probably have temporary encroachment on your property. So like if we're going through and building sidewalks, you know, we may need to, you know, peel up a little bit of asphalt on the backside of the sidewalk that's on your property. Um, if you don't give us permission to do that, we won't do that. We'll figure out how to make everything line up right at the property boundary, uh, but there may be um, we can do a better project both for us and for you all if we've got permission to do certain work on your property as a part of the construction process and then uh, obviously be available to answer questions. So if we could kick forward. So this, this exhibit uh, 
I think most of you know there's a lot going on on West River Street and in that corridor, or there will be very soon. So most of you probably know that the Truckee Donner Land Trust bought the property on the south side of the river. At the town council meeting last night, the town council uh, approved a $12.5 million contract to build the next phase of the Truckee River Legacy Trail. So what that would do is put paved trails in on the south side of the river from the Cottonwood area down to the river and all the way to, not all the way to Highway 89 on the other side, but most of the way to Highway 89. And then there would also be a bridge that would connect uh, what we refer to as the Old County Corpyard property across the river. So there'd be a, a bridge connection from West River Street down near Mill Street across the river, pedestrians only, no cars, that would create a, a new, so the, the only way to get there now from West River Street is to take the highway bridge on Brockway, on Bridge Street. Uh, now there would be a pedestrian only bridge that would connect those two things. So that's in the works and uh, we're, that'll be under construction this summer. Jessica is also working on a project to, this would probably be about three years, uh, put traffic signals in at the Bridge Street Commercial Row, Bridge Street, West River Street intersection and improve the sidewalks across the railroad tracks. Probably about a seven or eight million dollar investment to make that happen. We've been working with the railroad on that. A lot of details to work through and uh, that, that's, that's in the works as well. And then another project that's in the works is uh, what's called the West River Park Project. So that's the old county courtyard property, which is the vacant lot across from the Flyers uh, bulk plant. And the idea there is to basically open that up to the public and, and regrade it in a way that will make it much more uh, conducive for people to walk to that property and be able to get down to the Truckee River. Right now the, prop the, the area is perched up about 30 feet above the river and it's not, you, you can scramble down over the bank to get to the river, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a risky proposition for some folks to do that. So uh, the idea would be to improve that and create a river access spot on West River Street. Uh, maybe we can kick forward. This is some little bit more detail on on that area we're talking about. So the this is a schematic that I'm going to walk over there, and the online people are not going to like me because they probably won't be able to hear me. But you want me to point to something? You can stand up there. Sure, or maybe I'll talk here. So we've got you know Bridge Street here, West River Street here, Sports Hub there. Jack Steiner, the Jack Steiner parking lot. So I talked earlier about getting easements from the railroad. That was one of the areas we got an easement from the railroad for. So we used to lease that from the railroad. Now we've got an uh, easement, which effectively gives us long-term control. It's not a it's not a month-to-month -month lease anymore. Gives us a lot more comfort in investing money in that to reconfigure it, add some parking spaces, and make the parking work better there. Um, We've also, in terms of the easement, so that's the bulk plant, the Flyers gas station used to be Barry Hinckley. So that vacant lot that's next to it, and then there's a vacant lot behind it that the dependable tow folks park vehicles on. That's the other area where the town acquired easement from the railroad. So we own, we basically control those vacant lots now and in the future could improve those to add parking. We're not proposing to, we're, we've done some layout on what that can look like, but we're not including that as part of the West River Street project. The idea was to acquire that land, get it under local uh, control, and then have that as a resource so that if redevelopment continues to happen on West River Street, if maybe new development happens on West River Street, that there's land available to provide the parking for that development and that that could, be, uh, that could happen as time goes on, as development occurs, was the thinking there. This is the, the park project I was talking about. So the idea would be, again, to create a small park in the middle of that vacant lot and then leave a couple of uh, areas for commercial buildings on either side of it that hopefully could take advantage of the fact that they got a park <coughs> next door and create a, create a nice setting for the downtown area there. 
And then this is the Bridge Street intersection where there'd be a traffic signal here. This again Oops. would be future, then traffic signal at Commercial Row. Um, so with that, pan forward. That's that's a. Uh, I'll get back over here. What, what's the plan for uh, right there behind Barney's or the flyers over by like where um, uh, what is it, Truckee Tire? We have a gate right there that goes up to a switch that's on the railroad. Is there going to be parking, or is it going to be like a building or something like that? Uh, the easement that we got from the railroad yeah. was for parking. Okay. And we're aware of the gate, yeah. and that was uh, a condition of acquiring that easement was to keep that uh, open so that you guys can access it if you need to. Yeah. And we're not proposing to do anything there right now. This is a an idea, I guess I would call it, of what what a parking lot back there could look like. Uh, maybe we could pan forward. So this is that park project. This is a, kind of an artistic rendering of what that might look like on the and some other river. That's a better rendering of it. So again, the notion there is that that property's got a lot of fill that was put in there over multiple decades. Not exactly sure what the history of that was. There's probably some longtime Truckee, Truckee residents that know and aren't fessing up to it, but. Um, <laughs> Hopefully the, they aren't buried in there. <laughs> yeah. The idea would be to remove a fair amount of that fill to bring the land elevation down and provide better access to the river. So, and then put in some, some features that make it a comfortable place for for people to be so that's that's a again a schematic of what that looks like and will there be access from riverside drive as well to the park, to the park yeah. yeah so the access from so maybe we could go back one slide jessica so the question was would there be access to riverside drive to the park the answer is yes so this is Mill Street, and then Riverside Drive is here. Yes. This is where that bridge would go yeah. okay. across the river. Okay. So someone walking up Riverside Drive would kind of get to where that corner is, and this is where people always park abandoned vehicles. Yeah. We'd get rid of those. <laughs> uh, and then there would be, you could either take a left, and you could go down to the south side of the river and go to the trails down there, or you could go straight and get into the park. This is the lighting in the park, Dan. I don't know. I don't. We haven't gotten that far. Do you have, what do you have? Plans Would you like lighting in the park? What's that? Security on that part because I was like, I was fishing there the other day, right there where you say to scale down, and yeah, there's crack pipes there. But it's some bad stuff going on right there. Mm -hmm. So opening up that bridge on the other side to the Legacy Trail, bringing that around, what does that bring into our into our neighborhood? There is my question. So I'm pretty aware of what's happening there. Okay. So those are things to think about. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, let's kick on to the next slide. So this, this is a rendering of the bridge that's currently planned to be built. However, what's going to be happening over the next two to three months, that, so that bridge, so we got construction bids on that, about $6 million. Um, Truckee Donner Land Trust is paying three quarters of the cost of the bridge. Uh, they had hoped that the bridge would cost more like $3 million. Mm -hmm. So um, paying three quarters of $3 million versus three quarters of $6 million is two different things. So what we're going to be doing with the land trust is looking at comparing this bridge and the cost of it to a bridge that's more similar to ones we currently have on other sections of trail in town. So uh, for any of you who've been on the Trout Creek Trail, the one that goes up the Tahoe Donner, where it crosses Trout Creek, there's a steel truss bridge that goes across the, the creek there. Very similar to a bridge that goes across Martis Creek. So if you take the Legacy Trail out to Glenshire, just before you start going up the steep hill into Glenshire, there's a steel truss bridge there. So we're going to, and those are relative, those are pretty economical as far as bridges go. So what we're going to be doing is working with our contractor, comparing the cost of this bridge 
to what the cost of a steel truss bridge would be. We're going to be talking with the land trust about that. And if there's you know a, a, enough cost savings of going to a steel truss bridge, that may be what this ends up being. So instead of this, it may end up being the steel truss. It would have the same functionality. So for someone walking across the bridge, you're still going to be able to walk across the bridge. You're going to be at the same height on either end. Uh, it's just the appearance of the bridge from kind of what, what people are looking at that are not actually on it would be different. So, so that's, that's a conversation that's going to be happening over the next couple of months here, and that'll be on the town council agenda probably in late July, early August to make a decision on whether to change this out or, or stick with it. Uh, so the bridge probably won't go in until next summer, but right. it will be, it's, it's under contract right now to be constructed. Yeah. The, the commitments that are out there is there will be a bridge, the question of whether it's that one or another one that may be less expensive. So timing on all this stuff. So Legacy Trail Phase 4, that's going to start in a few weeks. You're going to see equipment out there. Um, contractor has this summer and next summer to get that work done. Contractors told us they want to try to get the bulk of the work done this year. Um, so we're hoping that they stick to that and that a lot of that trail work is available for you all to use uh, this fall. If, um, if things go slower than the contractor's hoping, then they would have next summer to finish it up. Ped bridge, same thing. We're, we're spending a little time looking at whether we want to try to uh, you know, get, get a less expensive bridge in there. Once we get that figured out, we're hoping the contractor can do some of the underground work. So the Bridges, you know, there's a lot of footing work to be done and a lot, a lot of work kind of below grade. Uh, our hope is that they could get a bunch of that done this year and then next year come in and actually put the bridge on top of it. The West River streetscape, so that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, that current plan for that would be to put it into construction next summer, 2023. In all likelihood, give the contractor up to two years to do the project, but give them cash incentives to get it done in one. So that's what we did on the Brickletown project when we built the curb gutter sidewalk in there. We gave the contractor a two-year time period uh, so that, especially in these days, you know, material availability is more of an issue than it used to be, um, as well as labor availability. So what we've been finding is that if we try to keep the construction windows too short that prices are going up significantly because contractors are bidding in a higher degree of risk into their construction bids because of uncertainty over ability to get materials, uncertainty over ability to get equipment and personnel. So what we've been finding is if we give folks a, more, a larger window, they've got a higher degree of certainty that they can get the work done in that time and we're getting better pricing on it. So our thinking is that we do that, but then we couple it with uh, a cash incentive to get done sooner so that this ends up being hopefully a high priority for a contractor and they're motivated to get it done in, in a single year. So that's, that's the, the two year time period with the goal of actually getting it done in a single summer. West River Street Park, again, we would see that as two summers from now. So part of the idea is to use that vacant lot to stage these other projects out of. So this bridge that we're putting across the river is going to need a staging area. So that old county courtyard vacant lot would be good for that. This West River Street project, again, having a combination of that vacant lot that we own and the, and the easement that we acquired from the railroad, using that as staging uh, gives the contractor a good place to base their operation out of. Once all that other work's done, then we can go in and put the park in uh, once we're done using it as a staging area. And then the reimagined Bridge Street, that's the uh, traffic signals, and we're looking at those as uh, two years out as well. So that's a, I'll stop here. That, that's a kind of a rendering of the traffic signals, and more importantly, what we're hoping would be the new sidewalks that would go across the railroad tracks there. Um, it's as much about improving the pedestrian crossing at that Bridge Street location as it is about, you know, helping vehicles get through there in a little more organized fashion. 
So I can stop here. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, no. If so, if the traffic signal goes in, then the signal would basically you'd either have the green or the red uh, on all approaches, and then the signal would communicate with the railroad tracks to make sure that any time a train's coming, the, the tracks that the vehicles can get off the railroad tracks. Yeah, no, 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 you're, you're, you're right on point. We looked at that. So it was general plan suggests we do roundabouts. We did a, a lot of work looking at roundabouts here. There are two things with them. One, because of the historic buildings being so close to the intersections, we didn't have room to put the roundabouts in without causing problems with the buildings, like causing them to have to go away. And then the other thing is that uh, currently, when um, when the when the trains come through, like if I'm going northbound and I want to maybe go to over towards Mountain Hardware, like right now it's a pretty easy shot for me to just go across the railroad tracks, to take a left, go down Commercial Row, check out what's going on there, head over to Mountain Hardware. But if a train comes, I'm immediately changing my plan and I'm making a left and I'm going over and using McIver Crossing to head over that way. Um, and I'm able to do that because there's another lane. So if people really want to go across the tracks and turn right, let's say to head up towards uh, the, um, you know, to, to the new rail yard area as an example, there's two lanes to accomplish that. So, you know, I can, I can make a left and not get stuck behind someone that may want to wait for the train to get through. With the roundabout, because of the space constraint, um, one vehicle that is like, no, I'm going to wait for the train to clear before I go into the roundabout and move on would basically back everyone up behind them. And so that was another thing we figured out is that the roundabout, when the trains are there, would, would back up significantly further than the signal would because the signal gives you a little more flexibility to, to change your plan. One on the south side of the railroad tracks, and then a, and then one on the north side. So one basically right in front of um, Bar of America at that intersection, yeah. and then the other one next to the Jacks lot. Yeah. So, um, I, I can come back if, if you guys have uh, other questions yeah, on any of this stuff. It's going to be safer to turn right to go up towards 7-Eleven right there off with West River Street because sometimes you pull up there. There's a crosswalk, so you have to go like all the way through the crosswalk pretty much to turn right to see anybody coming down. So I don't, like you said, there's obviously historic buildings there. There's not really much you can, you can't widen, you can't go anything more. Just seeing, is that light, right? Is that going to be a light, like a green light to turn right to go up that way and it will stop traffic coming down? Or is that just working with what our signals are with the railroad? Um, so there'd be a traffic light and it would, any time that, so like if there's a train there, we would put the green arrow on so that, you know, because if the train's there, people aren't coming south, you can just kind of make the right turn flow. If there's not a train there, then the right turn would be able to go most of the time, except when, if the southbound traffic's going, in which case you'd have the right on, you'd be doing a right on red. Is there, is there no talks about taking maybe that first parking spot out of the way right there on the right as soon as you Right? Usually that's always blocked with like a big box the, truck, which is probably part of the business there. The, the one that's just to the so south? When you're, well, yeah, to the Lots south. So when you come up to the stop there, you're looking right, you got to end your drive all the way out into the intersection to even see cars coming. Right. It's, just a, it's a sketchy intersection. I think we all know that. Yeah, it's tight. It's just, I'm just trying to see if, if they're going to, if you guys want to bring that up to maybe eliminate not having anybody parking there. So. You can actually see when cars are coming down the hill there. Yeah, we, we can we can look at that. It's all it's all about trade offs in the downtown yeah. area. Um, cause that make it safer for people to drive out. Cause yeah. I think people have been hit in that section too, just walking. Okay. Yeah, and that's in that signal project. It's it's as much. It's more about 
making it safer for pedestrians. Because right now to cross Bridge Street, you know, you're you're on your own. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're running. And, <laughs> and what the signal would do is, you know, you'd have the ped buttons, and you could you could hit the ped button, and it would stop the traffic to give you a safe crossing and not have to not have to do the Frogger crossing or whatever it is that, that people are doing down there. Um, and just to, the intersections will feel different with the, uh, signals too. Right now people pull forward really far, especially for that left-hand turn coming out of West River Street, because they can't see, be, because they have to like go as fast as they can, because that's a really hard left turn to make. When there's a signal there, the signal will tell you when you can go, so you won't have to, that car won't have to pull out as far to wait either. So the person that is making that right turn will have an easier time viewing it because the car isn't inching out as far as they can. So just those little things will change that intersection uh, quite a bit, I think. So it'll make it less sketchy, but it's not going to be perfect just because it's so tight and there's so much going on there. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jessica. Uh, one more question. Oh, yeah. uh, so I'm acting as a medium. Someone is asking whether they can communicate to you that's streaming it right now. Is there any way of doing that? Um, to communicate to me streaming? No. Oh, like ask questions? Yes. They could text them to you and, and we could... Uh, that's okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. Nah, folks want to, if you know folks in the room, or uh, I can give you my cell number. It's 530-414-3346. Uh, so if folks want to text questions in, go for it and I'll... Uh, Maybe we'll respond to them, maybe we won't. <laughs> so, See, you have the choice. Yeah. But uh, you, anyone can also email me any questions. I'm happy to meet out on site with people and, and that sort of thing. So. There's one input now. Oh, OK. OK. Any other questions on the future projects? Yeah, I have a question regarding timing on the uh, Western Street State as far as construction timing. Have you guys talked with contractors about is this looking more like it's going to be spring and fall? Is it going to be all summer? Is it going to be day, night? Yeah, so a good question. Uh, it's so tight down there. My opinion is that doing this at night is going to be least impactful to the businesses. Um, I'm, I'm, we've got, I'm concerned about the residents on Riverside Drive in terms of you know, nighttime operations. You know, we've got a pretty good row of buildings there that help to um, screen construction noise. We would also, if we go at nighttime, put requirements on the equipment. There's different, instead of the high-pitched backup alarms, which are usually the worst offenders in terms of nighttime nuisance issues, there's uh, ones that are just as effective to make sure you don't back over someone, but that are not as annoying to the rest of the world. So uh, my thought is that we should be working towards this being a nighttime construction project um, with some limited opportunities for daytime construction that can be done that is not as impactful to businesses as, you know, like July and August is not the time to be doing daytime construction and closing a lane. So I, I think what we're going to end up with is probably giving the contractor more flexibility to work at night in terms of doing road closures or one lane closures, giving them some flexibility to work during the daytime in the shoulder seasons, and giving them very limited flexibility to work in the daytime during the peak demand periods is what we would be uh, probably settling on. So, and I see, it looks like Zach walked in. Yeah. Want to introduce yourself, Zach? I, I'm Zach, I've got the, uh, the red light. Yep, and you know most of the other folks in here anyway, I'm sure, so. Um, I'm gonna switch. What, oh, one thing yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah. sorry. Oops. Well, just because you'd said most of the people were on, essentially on the alley side for the housing on West River. Not, not all of them, there's some right. on West River. Some are like our tenants, like facing straight out, you know, towards the street. So I'm, I'm just wondering, my question was, is when they do the night work, you know, you're essentially trying to provide less interruption for the businesses, it's kind of a give and take there. Some of the tenants are gonna have to deal with that, understand, but is it, 
for a little bit, and then they're going to be in this front of this building a little bit, or is it going to be the whole strip split? Up? I mean, I'm trying to visualize how that's. Yeah. So, a very good question. It it ends up it ends up being driven a lot by the contractors resources and scheduling and how quickly they're trying to get the job done um, in general if the contractor is trying to get the job done in a single season there's going to be more activity more often than if they're stretching it out over two years with that said it's I would not expect the entire length of the street to be under construction all the time for the entire construction season because there's operations like we got to dig trenches to put in storm drain and to put the utilities underground yeah that's like you, you run up the street with a piece of equipment and you're in front of this house you know these three houses one night and then you're kind of working your way up and down the line so it tends to there would be activity but there's it's going to be a different intensity at different times and it's not like there's going to be equipment nonstop all summer long in front of every single building. It's going to ebb and flow. So. What's going to be the storage yard for the contractor, and who is the contractor that was awarded? For the West River Street project? So there is no contractor. Uh, we're still in the design phase. Okay. Uh, so we, and where we would expect they would, uh, for storage yard would probably be the Old County Corp Yard. Which would be the park which would be the park later, it would be the it's a vacant lot now, and then potentially also the, the dirt lot across the street. Yeah. So I have a question about Riverside Drive. Yep. And um, if there's any delay in traffic on West River Street, will there be a limited, I mean, what's the plan to use Riverside Drive as uh, traffic flow? Because there, the, it's so tight. The plan is to not use it good answer right <laughs> right so we're definitely not going to encourage people to use it well so as, as you all know riverside is one way in the uh, westbound direction so if traffic's coming trying to get east and they get they get caught up in the construction here unless someone's going to blatantly blow the wrong way down a one-way street, which there may be a few people that do that. Oh, would do that. Right. Um, um, we're, I mean, some of that may happen, but that that's pretty egregious. And if a bunch of that starts happening, we'll work with our counterparts at the police department yeah. to, to rein that in. Uh, and then in the other direction, that's if you're coming northbound, making a left on West River. Um, that's where there'd be more risk of people wanting to go down Riverside Drive. But that would also mean that we've got traffic kind of backed out into the intersection down the street a little bit um, because you, you don't know if that you're, you're kind of on, for that other direction, you're gonna be kind of up on West River. So, so that's an issue we're gonna to need to manage, but the plan is not gonna be to encourage people to use Riverside Drive, and we would be actively discouraging it if it starts happening. And would Chief Renfro be given any additional funds to um, provide traffic control and bring in more people? Because I know we're short right now on officers in this community. Uh, Is there going to be a budget for him to handle these things, especially the growth of the community in that area? Probably not. I mean, I think we would just work with him with and within his existing staff resources. So I don't, I'm not I'm not envisioning, for instance, that we would. I mean, they have two officers on. Right. So I'm not in, right. So I'm not in. No, that's all we have. Yeah. So I'm not envisioning that we would hire another three police officers, as an example, to have all three shifts covered. You know, daytime, nighttime, weekends for the for the construction period. So I think we would be There's working. A lot of safety protocol there too for OSHA through the through the contractor. Yeah, so the contractor would, would need control. to. Because the last one that happened on Donner Pass Road, the yard was behind our house, and Richard Street was. Oh, well, you're. Where I live. Yeah. Richard Street was what you're calling what the front street of West River Street would be. And I could lay in bed and listen to him work all night. And Highway Patrol ran interference for him right there. Mm -hmm. Probably because it's within the highway boundary. Might have been, yeah, if it so was down. within the highway there, so they, they ran their traffic control for them 
at that point. So well, this is what's in town. That's what, why my question is that. Yeah. So we would work with the police department as needed. Uh, we're not anticipating that we would add a couple hundred thousand dollars to the project to hire more police officers specific to this project, though. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of opportunity to detour people across the railroad track either direction. You know, to yeah. go downtown and see what's going on downtown or Jaboom or... Yeah, we would use changeable message boards yeah. kind of on the periphery where people still have a chance to make a different decision to, you know, discourage traffic on that section of West River Street during times when when it uh, people are better off getting to and from wherever they're going, you know, on a different route, so... Yeah. Yes, sir? I think you might have answered the question, but there was a discussion of doing the utilities, bringing them underground as a separate phase before they did the streets. Yes. So I hear it's going to be the same contractor doing both? That's how we would bid the project. And, and thanks for asking the question. So with, when we built the Brickletown project, we we wanted to give the contractor again two years to do it so that if they needed it they could use the first year to put the utilities underground and the second year to do the street improvements that particular contractor was able to do everything in a single year and coordinate it all and so that would be our hope with this uh, as well as that you'd have one contractor to come through do the utility undergrounding first and then do the street improvements right behind it So the, what we're uh, looking at for utility work, in underground work, uh, some would be storm drainage because a lot of the drainage in this area is not well established. So it would be storm drain trenching that would be happening. Up on the poles, there's uh, electricity, telephone, and cable TV. So that would all go underground. The, we weren't planning on doing any work with natural gas other than uh, in any areas where there's existing gas lines that might be in the way of some of the work we're doing. We would work with the gas company to modify those as needed, but we're not anticipating doing any significant changes to the gas line out there. Uh, and then we've also got to coordinate with the PUD because there's a, a water line that runs down the street that we've got, we've got to figure out how to work around that or potentially relocate it and, and get it out of the way of some of the other work we're trying to do. What is the distance between the, there's also a, is that an eight or nine, eight, eight or nine inch? Uh, Kinder Morgan line. J, jet fuel, grade A jet fuel down the middle of West River Street. So it's actually down the north side of it. Down the north side. So what's the, what, will the utilities be running opposite side? Yeah, so the jet fuel pipeline, uh, any, trenching we would do we would be a minimum of five feet away from that and, and in all likelihood 10 feet away so so it wouldn't be the complete opposite side because there's already there's water there's um, jet fuel and there's natural gas already down that street so to find space for storm drain and then for the existing overhead utilities to go underground you know there's only so much room there so uh, that's one of the things that we're pretty well along you know we we are confident we can do it but there are areas where we'll need to be within five feet of the jet fuel line in order to fit all that stuff in and the jet fuel pipeline owner will be on site oh, yeah. pretty much all the time that they we're probably shut load down at certain times when they're getting close they could whether or not they actually would or not it's another question <laughs> okay. yeah um, yeah so Jessica do you want to so I, I jumped into a, a lot of the Q&A, touched on stuff I think Jessica is going to get into. But uh, we'll switch spots here and I can, sure. I can run the PowerPoint for you. Jessica is going to jump into some more detail on the, on the project itself. Yeah, so um, this is an image of one of the boards we have up here. It's over there if you want to get up close and personal and check it out. Um, it's kind of a colored uh, detail of the, what the overall streetscape is going to be. The project extends from about the end of the Jack's Diner parking lot entrance, um, right past the warehouses on the north side, 
and then um, uh, over to the corner of Mill Street. So that's the project extents. We're showing this Mill Street parking lot right now, just so you can see what's um, like a future parking lot is gonna be, but that is not currently planned to be built at the same time as uh, the rest of it this next summer. Um, we're gonna be using it as staging areas and, and things like that. Um, or if this has to have some of the parking um, closed down to work on it, uh, so parking can be used over here, that sort of thing. So kind of playing you know, Tetris with areas out there. Um, and then it includes a pedestrian crossing on this end, there will be a median island with a crosswalk in that area that will be installed next summer. And then uh, three additional uh, crosswalks in different areas. Here. Okay, you can keep going. Cool. <laughs> Dang. Mm -hmm. um, and we've gone over our project goals in the past. Um, a big project goal is to put in sidewalks on both sides of the road so that we are pr prioritizing the pedestrian connections, making it safer for pedestrians to walk back and forth to businesses, homes, that, that sort of thing on this street. Um, also providing that ADA access that many of you don't have um, to businesses and homes in that area. Um, it also encourages that pedestrian flow from this West River Street area to downtown, to the rail yard area, and other areas of town. So we're trying to connect everything. Um, and with things like these sidewalks, plus the you know legacy trail being built and the bridge and that sort of thing, um, I would expect a lot more pedestrian traffic between downtown, through West River Street, over to the trail, park area, that sort of thing. Um, we also want to retain and enhance the West River Street character, charm, and history. That's a big thing down here. You guys have some really cute buildings and character down there. Um, optimize parking, um, make it more efficient. There's some very inefficient parking down there, sometimes blocking lanes, um, you know, poached into wherever you can fit a car, that sort of thing. And then also to underground the utilities. So that's what this project kind of covers. Go ahead. Sorry, I was texting Allison. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just as a reminder, this is why this project is needed. I don't know if you guys have tried to walk down the existing sidewalks on this street before. It's not ma consistently maintained. Some people maintain it, some people don't. You have the cars sticking out into the lanes. Um, you know, even this building is like right on the side of the road, so you, it's really, you have to make sure you look before you get around it. We're trying to fix some of these problems. And you can click it again. Um, we do have a lot of design considerations we've made going through this area. Um, it's really constrained. That, that is um, easement from the railroad. It's a lot of railroad land. The town doesn't necessarily own it. Lots of overhead utilities, the Kinder Morgan pipeline, existing utilities. Um, then uh, main, making sure we're maintaining access to adjacent properties and connectivity to adjacent projects. Um, we also have the ongoing private redevelopment projects that are coming, those, those five lots kind of at the western end of this project and making sure we fit those in and places for those as well. Um, and then uh, other design considerations such as funding. Um, that's always the issue, right? Coming up with the money. So go ahead. <laughs> um, this is the, an image of the Union Pacific Railroad image that we acquired from the railroad. So um, the corner here, uh, a little bit bigger area for the Jack's Diner parking lot than we had before. So including that kind of dirt area in front, which is where those head in parking spaces off of the street will go. Um, enough room for a sidewalk in front of the buildings on the Union Pacific Railroad. And then um, the Mill Street parking lot and uh, the area behind fires and the tire shop. So yeah. this is an image of where this property is. That we yeah, and, and I'd like to just throw a shout out to Mike Upton on this. So the, the railroad, there's a lot of different divisions. There's a real estate division and there's an operations division and there's a lot of stuff like that. So Mike is the guy who's the onsite guy that runs the rail yard here in Truckee. 
And at the end of the day, deals like this don't happen unless he says it's okay. Because at the end of the day, the operations division and the local operations guys have a lot of say in these kinds of decisions. And the fact that uh, Mike was, I'm not sure if he was uh, if it's supportive, but not feeling like he needed to object to this. And he, you know, and he, that's not a fair. I don't know. You, you, were, you were supportive of it. I mean, Mike was actually supportive of it, but. Um, yeah, that was it. Was a big deal. Um, so what we've found over time is to do these deals with the railroad, it's you kind of got to get have the right people in the railroad in the right positions at the right time to be able to make something like this happen. Because uh, if someone in real estate doesn't want it to happen, then it doesn't happen. If someone from Omaha doesn't want it to happen, it doesn't happen. If Mike doesn't want to happen, want it to happen because he's the, the local guy, it doesn't happen. So you got to get people at all different divisions kind of in, in alignment. And uh, none of that happens without Mike. And I, I think he went to bat for us on a couple of things here. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we acquired this. We just finished that deal in November, so it took quite a long time to get that done. Um, and uh, we bought it for $2.1 million. So it, um, the town now controls that area. Um, so one of the first steps we'll do for this project is the undergrounding of the utilities. Um, most of this is the transmission lines on the south side. These are secondary transmission lines. Um, you, we won't have a lot of connections directly to your buildings. Most of your connections are from the Riverside Drive, but there are still a few. Um, I know the guys on the north side, um, Michael, your, your buildings will have connections that we'll need to coordinate with and that sort of thing. Um, and so, but there are still a few that we'll need to get with you of how they're gonna come into your buildings and that sort of thing. So. Um, this is the extents of where the undergrounding is gonna go. So we're not doing all of this area with the West River Street project, but this shows the extents of the undergrounding that's going to occur in these, er, this area for both of those projects combined. Um, River, uh, sorry, Reimagine Bridge Street will do the area for in, on East River Street, and this project is gonna do the area from um, about Jacks on the Tracks and Bridge Street uh, all the way down to uh, there's kind of a power pole past where um, old trestle distillery and that cabinet shop is. So it's, uh, it goes all the way down to that, la that last pole beyond it. Basically to where the power lines go from the south side of the street to the north side, yeah. right? So that everything on the south side will end up being underground. Yeah. Um, and then this is an exhibit for the existing and proposed parking. Um, as you can see, with all this work, we end up with pretty much a wash. Um, we are taking away some of these um, kind of parking areas that are used in the right of way right now, um, but they're then creating more parking in like the Jack's Diner parking lot. That gets reconfigured. The angled head in parking will be better than the um, parking in front of the sports hub. It won't stick out into the street. It'll be more like what you see in Brickletown. And um, that parking lot gets a little bigger. And then we have the future parking lot so that Mill Street parking area provides um, quite a bit extra that could be built when other developments come online, such as the park, the, the private developments within the park, um, maybe other buildings change uses, things like that. So that parking is available for the future to add to this area as well. Yeah, and just to add an exclamation to what Jessica is saying, yeah, this, the, the project we're proposing to build next summer, it's not going to add parking. It's not going to remove parking. It will move it around. You're going to have less on the south side of the street and more on the north side, uh, just because a lot of that parking on the south side needs to move to create room for the sidewalk. But then we're able to replace it on the north side. And then with this land acquisition we did, we've got room to add as time goes on as it's needed. Um, so this is another exhibit that we do have around the room of the Jack's Diner parking lot. So you can see how this is going to look. Um, it will be a fairly wide sidewalk with some benches and trees, tree, street trees. Um, and uh, the angled uh, head and parking off of the street. But then this parking lot is going to turn into two-way parking lot. Um, you can go in and out from both entrances. Um, 
it will get reconfigured here so you can, if you need to go into the station parking lot, it's a little easier on this end. Um, and uh, some landscaping along the backside uh, to kind of screen the railroad fence and that sort of thing. And again, crosswalks. Yay, crosswalks for getting across the street. <laughs> Um, this is the future Mill Street uh, parking lot, and again, this is where the pedestrian median island would connect. We will be building this with your project um, and just kind of ending it at a, uh, a ramp in that area um, to tie it in, but you will still have that pedestrian median island and crosswalks at either side. And um, we kind of designed this one to have more of a, a river theme to it since it will be kind of in front of the access to uh, the Truckee River. Um, some other streetscape design. We do have a set of plans here if you guys want to dig in deep to your properties or anything like that when this is done. And this is uh, the sports hub right here with a um, red light next to it. Um, this area will have kind of a, a plaza area, a small area in front so that we're improving drainage. There's a lot of drainage issues with these two buildings because the um, doorways are lower than the street right now. So we're trying to improve that a little step or two down to get to this area from the uh, sidewalk elevation that will be at the um, street. Um, some, and, and then some drainage to help them keep the water away from their front door in there. Um, again, crosswalk here. And the um, station, just parking layout gets a, a little bit reconfigured as far as striping and where people park. This entrance goes away and it becomes stairs. So that steep kind of driveway on that side um, will be pedestrian connection. Um, I think that's it. And then, so some of the existing challenges we have with these areas, um, I know Cornerstone Bakery has these ramps that go up. One doorway is about a foot higher than the next doorway. And so uh, trying to accommodate that and get people in there, ADA access and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the some substandard parking we have in front of these buildings, um, not great ADA access, uh, limited outdoor dining for these uh, restaurants that we have in this area. I think this is a valuable asset to kind of activate the street in this area to have some um, lively um, outdoor dining and street stuff going on. Um, these areas have some poor drainage, especially over by the um, sports hub. And um, all of these uh, buildings are, I, I think are pretty unique for this area and kind of add to that charm and character of uh, the downtown area. So this will be kind of the focus and um, street uh, plaza kind of area of your improvements. Yeah. I was just thinking, so right now we're looking at the buildings as they are with whoever is in them, leasing them, mm -hmm. owning them. So I'm just gonna say, let's say for whatever reason, 10 years down the line, we decide we're gonna sell J.D. Haas hardwoods and carpet, we're gonna sell our building. And now it can turn into something different. It can turn into a restaurant and the driveway that we have right now that we use for our, um, either customer parking, employee parking, whatever it is, that can now become a patio area. Or I'm just saying, how does this take, this project plan take into consideration the changes of the businesses that are there, whether they stay in business, become a residential, because ours can go either, either way. Um, I'm just saying, what is, how does all these changes with the streetscape take those changes into consideration with the type of business that would be in there? Well, um, a lot of these changes, except for this ramp, a lot of these changes are actually occurring in the right of way in front of the um, uh, Morgan's and the bakery area. So that's in adding space in the right of way to accommodate some of these grade changes and drainage and all of that kind of stuff that these buildings have problems with. And that we, um, as we go further down, we have worked with people and they've done, they will be doing like streetscape loans to do improvements on their own private property 
Um, so that is an option too. So we're putting in a sidewalk most of the way down that's basically up to property lines. If you so choose to add something in the future to where your parking is, um, adding that on private property is totally something that would be you could be open to. Um, and the way we've handled it before in the past. The, pl the plans are always taking into consideration the changes. It's more or less a structural and a pedestrian safe way. Safe yeah, way. yeah, and to a certain degree, we're. Um, it's helpful to get input from the adjacent property owner. So using Brickletown as an example, Steve Rembert used to have a cabinet shop in Brickletown right next to Burger Me. Yeah. And that was a functioning cabinet shop when we were building the, the uh, Brickletown streetscape. And what was important to Steve at that time as a functioning cabinet shop was that he have a loading area directly, you know, right close to his cabinet shop. And that also worked for his neighbors because it's like, okay, that can be the truck loading zone that can serve your building, but it can also serve your neighbor's buildings. And so it, it worked well. And then a couple years later, uh, Steve decided to convert that to a restaurant. And we had, you know, on street parking there that had previously been a loading zone. So then we basically changed the signage and, and got rid of the red paint on the curb and then made that parking because at that point, the loading zone was less important to that property than the parking. So there's things like that that um, can happen uh, where we can, and, and it, that's just one example, where we can try to, um, try, try to make sure we're accommodating current, sit the current situation, but also be thinking to the future and how to make a quick change to accommodate the future. Yeah, for the most part, this is a sidewalk going through here to provide, you know, ADA access and pedestrian connections and things like that. And we're trying to work with each property owner for the like transition behind how that sidewalk transitions into your existing property. Um, so for the most part, you know, you might be able to meet it, but there might need to be, like Dan said before, you might need to, you know, cut a little bit of extra asphalt in and put it in at a different slope just to make it a neat and tidy seam. Does that make sense? Yes, it okay. does. Mm -hmm. and, and as you're thinking about how you might be using your properties in the future, how they might be converting, you know, to the extent you want to share that with us, we can, and that that may help us build flexibility into this to make it happen, that's, we would, we would appreciate that. Like if you, like just as an example, if you didn't want your parking spaces anymore in, in the front and are thinking that's in the near future, we could do something like build, instead of driveway aprons right now, we could build in a sidewalk that has like a, a concrete slab underneath it with the paver so it looks like a sidewalk, but that you know you can drive over. Something like that. Yeah, because we've already have people approaching us wanting to rent out our garage and make it into a walk-up restaurant. You know, it's just, there's always just stuff that's already... Or they're trying to buy our parking or rent it from us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just, okay. you know, just good to know how this, that we can address those things individually, obviously. Yeah, so let me know if you have any ideas like that, and I'm happy to, you know, think things through with you guys and how that might work. But I know you guys have existing driveways there right now that you use that we just need to accommodate your existing use for. Okay. Um, hey, Jessica, I think there's another. Oh. I can wait if there's a question. Yeah. No, go ahead. I, I was curious. I got new tires the other day at, at the tire place on West River. And I don't know if you know that gentleman, the owner, but he stands out with a radar gun and uh, has a good data set going of how fast people drive through that zone. And if any of you have backed out of our buildings, you know that it's like almost like slightly kamikaze depending on the time of year, right? How stressed the people are, how fast they're coming from the other side of town. So I guess my question is, you know, that is to me is like a significant issue and, and I love this. I love all the pedestrian stuff, but what, do you have any plans to mitigate the speed issues that we already see? Because it's just a weird zone. Psychologically, you're transitioning from like kind of like a country drive into a high dense area, and it doesn't seem like the speed limit drops appropriately for what. It anyway, goes straight from 45 to 25. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I just want. I mean, like, I, are you guys are you guys working on that? So some of the features that are designed into this will help with that. Um, just putting up signs won't help with your speed issue out there. 
Um, the radar ones, though, that show you how fast you're going, those can. Like, I, I do think that there's some corrective measures. I, anyway, I'm sure there's studies have been done. I'm not a traffic person. So, but. Were you around when we did Brick Roll Town? Yeah. Um, so that street was very similar at the end between where Burger Me is up to about Spring Street. It was wide open kind of dirt mud puddles on the side. You could go as fast as you want. It was a, a speed issue from Commercial Row all the way to where the roundabout was. Um, and with putting in sidewalks, putting in parking on the street to make it feel more constrained and tight and um, that sort of thing, one of the property owners had the same exact um, thoughts you did, and we said, why don't you wait until this is done? If it still doesn't fix the right. speed problem, then we will um, revisit that. But most of these design things, even just like the pedestrian median island on the uh, west end will help with kind of, that's your entrance to where you have your businesses and things like that. And in the future, when um, Old Trestle Distillery, that area gets built, um, there will be a second one in front of that building as well. So that should help with some of that uh, traffic calming. And crosswalks. And crosswalks for both of those areas. What did you say there'd be, uh, uh, Old Trestle, you said there'd be another light, no? Uh, another pedestrian median oh, island. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think you can flip it. So this is an image of cut that area in front of Morgan's and the bakery. Um, they have a, an ADA ramp that goes up here. Uh, when we did the um, grading and stuff for that, it's not quite compliant. So we move the ADA um, access to the middle of this, and then you can get to both of those um, buildings through there. Um, the ADA. Uh, and then there'll still be the alley between the Sports Hub and Morgan's and access through that area. These will be, um, these are kind of movable planters, but um, I think we're designing this to be pretty much there for a while. The um, fences are designed to be used out of the, the tin building that's actually going to be removed in the future next to the warehouses that is being demoed um, as a it was when we purchased the um, Union Pacific Railroad easements, that was a requirement for us to demo that building. Um, so some of those uh, materials will be used to build this fence. We already started got a demoing in the windstorm, you know. <laughs> sure. I got a question on the designs and stuff. Yeah. So why, why do we have so many like nooks and crannies when it snows in a place like that? It kind of doesn't make sense to me why we're making it look like somewhere where it doesn't snow. You want to go back? You mean nooks and crannies up like, here? Like no straight angles, like making it very difficult to clear snow or when it dumps, like where you put all that stuff, you know? For the most part, this sidewalk is a straight area and we clear like a six foot wide path. So if there's areas outside that, other than like to a front door, um, we sometimes le we don't always clear the entire sidewalk on a, a on, on the um, pedestrian access. We'll clear a path right. initially. So there won't be parking on that side of the road then. There is going to be a loading zone right in front of the sports hub, and then there'll be some other uh, parallel parking either end of this. But it just there won't looks be. Like that's like the whole street. <laughs> this is the street edge. Yeah, so there will be some areas where the curb line will be right next to the travel lane, and then any places where there's room for a couple of parking spots or a loading zone, it'll it'll there'll be like a cut in, so it'd be like that. And then on the sidewalk, like Jessica was saying, we're making sure the design accommodates a basically room to run a small tractor down the sidewalk to do the, the kind of a path for snow removal. And then the connections back to the buildings would be on the property owners to deal with that. And but then the town will, you know, I mean, your your brother he works down here all the time doing the wintertime snow removal, which that a whole operation will be moving snow out to the street, pushing the snow from the street into the parking lots like the Jacks lot, staging it there, and then running our nighttime off haul operation to haul it to another part of town. So, but you're right, this is. This is going to create more work for snow removal. 
because right now it's just kind of wide open asphalt out there and we run our tractors up through there. It's all done with loaders and large equipment. You know, this is going to require smaller equipment and in more confined spaces. So it's it's really part of the trade-off. So is that essentially going to bring more jobs to the public works, I guess, to bring more people to work? Uh, it could. I mean, what, what happens is as, as we kind of create like more sidewalks to clear snow from it requires manpower to do that so we're yeah we have added staff in recent years like to make sure we've got the snow removal covered on you know down on Donner Pass Road next to the high school and Mountain Hardware and PUD that whole zone when we did the sidewalks in Brickletown so so it, it does uh, cause our staff to increase and we're, we're going to get to that in a bit where you know the maintenance side of this and how that would be paid for. And then the people that do have those garages there they're going to have access to get in they're not going to have a big um, berm or like a, a crosswalk like piece that sits each. You mean like the, yeah, like, like these, these guys? Right here, yeah. I don't have access to so I'm very particular. Right. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm not saying people aren't going to have berms, no, 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 uh, but we're not we're, we're not going to block people's driveways. Yeah, not as far as so I'm saying like the curb for the crosswalk, like they'll be able to still drive their yeah over the pavers and it won't yeah. affect them or whatever. Yeah, okay. unless someone says, hey, I don't want that driveway anymore. Put the sidewalk across in front of it. Don't worry about it. But folks that want to maintain their driveways, that's what will happen. I was just going to point out that um, Brickletown is a good example of some of these pop-outs where there, there's people sitting and, you know, it could straighten out the street, but it's also a visual for the people that are driving to slow the people down that are driving so quickly. There, there's a lot more going on. So as they see more activity, it tends to make them want to see. Yeah, yeah we're we're very confident that this street design is going to result in traffic doing about 20 miles an hour through here and the only reason i have that confidence is we're using the same uh, design standards as we used in brickletown and that exist on commercial row and that that you know that that tightness of the street if you will is causing people to drive right around that 20 mile an hour mark and so uh i just I, I'm highly confident that we'll achieve that here too. Um, and in Brickletown, we have some areas like this also, and we coordinated with um, the the property owners. So, like the property owner would be responsible for kind of clearing this interior area and getting the snow out into the street to be taken with the the, the road maintenance. So. We had some requirements when we did agreements for these types of things of like timing of the snow removal and that sort of thing. So um, it's it does have to be coordinated, but it was, because you don't have any place to throw snow when you have a, um, a front yard like this. So yeah, it, it, it has been done before and it is being done currently in Brickletown. Um, so this is just a plan view of what that looks like with the crossing here. Um, the, the reason why this is not a straight line is because we needed to make room for the ADA landing area. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, some of the things that might change is this won't be a kind of funky ramp down to this building. We're going to have a couple stairs here and a, a step down over here as well, since this is now the ADA access. Um, some, this is an example of the pavers we would be using out there, similar to what we're using in other parts of town. It's kind of a mottled brown um, pavers that look, weather, that, that look weathered. Um, after putting in lots of different paver patterns in other areas of town, we've decided we'd like to stick to the same ones for maintenance purposes and restocking purposes. Um, so those are just some areas we'd be using some of the same materials in um, in the West River Street project, including like the same type of street lights and um, the uh, bike bike racks. Yeah, so you can scroll through those. Um, we have a new style of garbage can. These don't have to be emptied quite as frequently. They are compactors 
And these are the types we would be looking to put down in the downtown area. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the easements and license agreements. I think Dan touched about that uh, a little bit earlier. Um, where we need to like get onto your property just to like make your where where the property line is meld with your properties, we'll need license agreements just to do that kind of um, transition work. In some areas, we may need easements. Um, those areas, I think, like uh, the old Tanini house, Allison Schelling's property, she wanted to get rid of the ADA space and um, and put in a, a little bit wider sidewalk in front of her building. That would require an easement in there if it's going to be maintained by the town and have, have public access. So um, that would be the difference. If we just need to go and, and do some work on your property to um, make things um, transition better, just a license agreement, if it's going to be um, maintained by the town through the assessment district and then uh, used by the public, you'll want an easement for it because then it shifts the liability to the town. Any, any questions on those? <laughs> those differences okay um, the schedule for this is um, we're at about 60% design right now and we're going to be working on the assessment district for the next month or two and um, we expect to have the 90% design of uh, this project done at the late summer and um, we need to have our project out like final contract documents by about November and uh, out to bid by then um, so just to give you an idea of where that timing is, uh, we hope to award this in January to a contractor and then start construction next summer. I have a question, Ms. Hassan. Yeah. I mean, I know it's going out to bid. Is there, um, is the same contractor that did Purple Town also available? I mean, going to be in the, included in the bid? I'm just- We would hope so. Through familiarity of efficiency of already knowing the project and how it, how it would work. I just imagine, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, that it would go much more smoother on the on West River Street project because of the area doing it on the other side. It would definitely be helpful as if it's the same people there too, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, because I mean, there's, I mean, I'm just wondering if that's taken into consideration in the Un generally no and and it's because of the public contracts code which is really intended to make sure that people like us aren't cutting bro deals with uh, with our friends and relatives on projects like this so it would be great if Q and D uh, uh, who did the Brickletown project had the same crew that was available to to do this project and they could be the low bidder, you know, that would definitely make things a lot simpler. Are we going simpler. with low bidder, Dan, or are we going with quality? We we're have going to with, go with low bidder. We're going, I'm asking the question yeah. because so, the so, so, we're, so we're going with both. So the quality is dictated by the bid documents we put out. So the documents we put out, it shows here's where the curbs are going, here's where the crosswalks are going. And then there's a there's a book that stands behind it that basically says here's how it all has to be built. The spec sheet. The spec sheet. Um, so the the quality is is baked into the contract when we put it out to bid. Uh, with that said, it's more of an an efficiency thing. Yeah. So if you get you can get contractors that are more customer service oriented, uh, and some that are less customer service oriented, but and. You know the ones that are more customer service oriented. You you don't have to you don't have to hit them with the book as often. The ones that are less customer service oriented, you got to pull the book out more frequently, and it, it's just kind of a different working relationship depending on on who you get. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as timing goes, again, this has been you know kind of kicked out a few years at this point. It seems. Uh, and I know you can't give me a definitive answer, but what would be your level of confidence that you break ground on this project, you know, a year from now, next spring, summer? Um, probably 90% that we will do it. There's still some unknowns. 
Yeah. I think I might ask you this last time. I assume all the parking is going to be paid parking. Is there any kind of fourth thought for doing like a resident parking permit? Is there any kind of residential lots that we have? We do have a residential parking permit that you can get through police downstairs, right? Yeah. yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. So there. So the answer is yes. That will be taken into consideration. It. it it, that's uh, it, it evolves, you know, the way the parking is managed and you've seen it, you know, owning property down there. It's like it'll be two hour parking and then it may evolve to uh, paid parking. Uh, and then so it the spaces are there, then how they're managed tends to change based on the needs of the neighborhood as time goes on. And I forget, is there overnight parking downtown during storms? So I just, yeah. I'm just thinking for people at permanent residence, is there going to be an option where you can leave your car with the proper permit without you know getting towed during snow removal? Yes, and so currently on West River Street, you can do that in the jack slot. Okay. Um, a lot of times after big storms, you if you go into the jack slot, it's, it's a mess. That's the reason. Um, one of the things this project will do is actually makes the parking lot wider which is going to make it more um, it, it'll make it possible for us to actually continue to allow that overnight parking to happen in there but also do snow removal in the areas where the cars aren't parked where right now it's almost impossible because it's too tight yeah, too tight yeah or you can get it in but you end up paying damage claims because of cars that get bumped yeah. into I was curious what the rationale was for not including the Mills Park one as part of the West, West River Street State, given your net zero on parking spaces that, while you're at it kind of thing. Why wouldn't you include the Mills Park one as part of the space? Money. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a little over $8 million in the budget for the project right now. I'm pretty sure we're going to end up spending more than that. And... Um, you know, our um, observation is that most of the time, uh, except during the real, real peak, peak periods, there's enough parking on West River Street to serve the businesses. So the thinking is that if we can make it easier for pedestrians to access that area and maintain the parking count, that um, that we're not going to be putting people out of business and that by having acquired the land to add more parking uh, when that, if and when that changes that we're that we think I've, we've got our bases covered there we are not planning on barricading it off and posting it no trespassing or anything like that so um, you know if it starts to get abused in some fashion we may have to be more um, kind of assertive in terms of how that's managed but you know that sat there as a vacant lot for quite a long time and um, it's not doesn't look that great or anything but I don't I haven't heard that there's been lots of abuse that has resulted in the need to do kind of kind of change what's going on there. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Mike. You know, you're the Mike. I think Mike. Park there anyway, and all that, and yeah. Once that building is down, which appears from the condemned, maybe gravel or something just to make it a little more aesthetically pleasing. Could yeah, it could be something like that. I don't know, Mike, from, I mean, from a railroad standpoint, have you had issues with that area? No, there's two things that would make us act. Is it getting abused, you know, trespassing, whatever that looks like, or if it affects our operations. And as of now, the only trespassing that goes on there is just coming to this town and spend money and chunky Thursday. So as long as it doesn't affect our operations, I won't act on anything. Yeah, okay. So will it be, is it allowable for chunky Thursdays? Yeah, from the town's perspective, we're not we're not planning on closing it down. If it starts blocking their <clears throat> access to the their railroad and there is a gate in that area that they use and access through, that will be the issue. Yeah. We don't make money by putting fences up and things like that. We do it to protect the public from us. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just follow up on that. So since you aren't doing the mills, street parking. 
What's the uh, north? Where's the north side um, sidewalk going to end? The north side sidewalk will end right at that um, on on the west side of the warehouse building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just basically right at the crosswalk. Right at the crosswalk where that vacant lot. The second crosswalk. Yeah, or the, the third. One from the roof, the or the third. The, the okay. furthest one. We'll still have Yeah, the right there. Right, right there. there. And then, because the building's too close to the road, right? Yes. Okay, three and part then, question. Where'd you allocate the $8 million from? From the general fund, so it's basic general, taxpayers fund. general taxpayer money. Where's the money from the parking going? The parking district. Yeah, and what are they using that money for? I guess it's a four part. So the the parking district money, uh, a lot of the two point one million to buy these the vacant land came from parking district funds that have accumulated over the years. The balance of the parking district money is paid to um, fund like the snow removal on the parking spaces. Used to be we were paying railroad leases on the parking spaces. Um, enforcement, kind of the O&M on it. So, that's so the snow removal only is taking care of, of the parking spaces but not in the right of way on the sidewalks. Correct. That so was the general thought when it first <coughs> You know, Downtown Merchants Association, obviously, you're very familiar with that, which brings it up. And who's responsible for moving the snow and paying for it all and maintaining these sidewalks coming to our community? So that's a great segue to the next part of our presentation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is uh, the adjacent property owners. Uh, it, that's that's how it's been handled elsewhere. So that's the, you know, we talked about the assessment district at our last public meeting. I was going to go through that again uh, right now. Sorry, just slightly just a different question before you move on. Uh, there's the storm drain that goes between our two properties that wasn't, there's no easement. Can you go to talking about it, uh, diverting it down towards the park? Has, has there been any movement on that? Uh, the design currently shows that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we've got, I don't know who put those drains in, but they did it a long time ago, and some of them go under buildings, and they're, they're in weird not good spot, so we're trying to clean that up as much as we can. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Okay, okay and we can come back to this. Maybe I'll just sit here. <laughs> you guys are less intimidating the further away <laughs> I am. Um, so landscape and late and lighting maintenance districts this is what JD was asking about, and I think we've talked about this before. So what the uh, town is um, looking for is, you know, we're, when I say we, you know, the taxpayers, the town council, I work for ultimately the town council, uh, they, they're basically saying, hey, we're willing to come up with the money to build this stuff, but we want to make sure that there's an ongoing revenue stream to take care of it. We don't want to spend eight or 10 or whatever, however many millions of dollars this ends up being, and then just have it not be taken care of. And uh, we've got models for this elsewhere in town. When the Brickletown project was done, we, we put what's called an, an assessment district in place where each property owner <coughs> contributes into a fund. They, you, you pay the money through your, it's part of your property tax bill. There's a piece of it that so it's not it's it's a surcharge on your property tax. It's not part of the existing. So it's a surcharge that gets accounted for separately by the by the county. They send the money back up to us. We pool that money and then we do the maintenance on it. So we've got districts like that. The Brickletown project has one of those. The uh, the project over on Donner Pass Road, adjacent to the PUD and the high school, has a maintenance district like that. All the sidewalks in the rail yard are, that's how those are funded. There's a maintenance district for them. So that's what's being proposed here. Uh, in the, with these other projects, you know, one of the conditions really that the, that the council put on the, on the funding was that the maintenance district should pass. And I think the thinking was that if, <clears throat> if the investment, if, if property owners aren't, um, don't see enough value in the project 
to help fund the maintenance district that maybe it's the wrong place to invest the money. Uh, maybe there's better places to spend that money uh, in other parts of town. So that's kind of the underlying, I guess, philosophy there. Um, so to create one of these maintenance districts, there's a, there's a process because at the end of the day that has you all as property owners voting yes or no as to whether or not you're supportive of it. The, the basic uh, concept behind it is, you know, you, we put together an analysis that says, okay, here's how much it is going to cost to maintain this. So it would be snow removal, uh, cleaning the sidewalks in the spring. You know, as the pavers get old, they'll occasionally need to be removed and replaced. Uh, there's irrigation. Uh, for landscaping that needs to be maintained, uh, the service connections for the for the irrigation you've got to pay for that. You know, there's all these costs that come along with taking care of something like this. So the process to do it is we create what's called an engineer's report. It documents here's what the cost is to maintain this, and then here's how we're proposing to spread that cost out across the property owners that abut the sidewalk. It goes through a public hearing process. There's hearings in front of the town council uh, as this is being formed. At the end of the day, there's a vote that the property owners take. And the concept is if, uh, let's say, Joe's assessment is going to be $1,000 a year and uh, Beth's is going to be $1,500 a year. I'm just pulling those numbers out of the air. Uh, Joe gets 1,000 votes. Beth gets 1,500 votes. So the more your assessment is, the more voting power you have, uh, with the idea being that um, it's kind of that that's fair because if someone's getting a, uh, getting assessed two dollars and someone's getting assessed two thousand dollars, it's not fair to kind of give them equal um, kind of equal footing in terms of passing this or not. So ultimately, there's this process that happens. Ballots go out to each of the property owners, and then those get mailed back in, and then it's counted, and if it's uh, more than 50% in favor, then the assessment district passes. If it's less than 50% in favor, then the assessment district fails. Um, this map is kind of convoluted, but I'll, it's, I'll try it's to explain on the it. It's table, too, so yeah. you can look at it in detail over there. So the proposed maintenance district boundaries actually go from the south side of the river across the Truckee River Bridge they would include the sidewalks that would ultimately get built all the way up to the railroad tracks, and then the new sidewalks along West River Street all the way over to the, um, in front of the, what we're calling the old trestle, that's, um, uh, used to be a cabinet shop out there. So what is shown in purple are areas that are, it's kind of like no man's land in terms of an adjacent property owner. So you got the bridge across the Truckee River. You know, there really isn't an adjacent property owner to say, hey, you need to maintain that sidewalk. You've got, you got this section of sidewalk that would go up across the railroad tracks. It's next to a railroad house. Uh, if we send the railroad a bill for sidewalk maintenance, it's not going to get paid. And so we recognize that. Uh, no offense, Mike, but just we, we've been around that block. So, um, over next to Jack's Diner, same thing. You've, Jack's has frontage on the corner. Um, you know, they were like, "Well, gee, do I have to pay for a sidewalk on both sides of my house, or you know, shouldn't or of my business shouldn't you know the sidewalk that's on the main drag that's you know getting people across the railroad tracks is that should that really be on my nickel or elsewhere? So everything you see here in purple, the notion is that the town would would pay the same square footage costs as anyone else would, but for those areas because there's really not an adjacent property owner to pick that up, and that includes the properties here that are in front of the railroad. So there's the the railroad house on West River Street, and then there's the railroad building that used to be the station. Again, that building is owned by the railroad. So the notion is that the town would pay for that portion of the sidewalk maintenance. This is that old county courtyard property I was talking about. Uh, that would be incorporated in the maintenance district, and to the extent that that ends up with sidewalks on it, you know, we as a 
adjacent property owner then would take on the responsibility for paying sidewalk maintenance assessments for that area. So that's what the what the town the areas that the town would be uh, funding would be these purple areas, and then the areas that were that's adjacent to property that we own. So then what's left are the sidewalks that are on the frontage of the businesses. Um, you know, this is, you know, that's uh, Wendy uh, Smith's place there, uh, 1887. That's the right number? Yeah, yeah. 1887. Um, there's already sidewalk there, so they currently maintain that privately. So the notion would be that they would be uh, included in the district and then they would pay the assessments and then we as the town would start doing that sidewalk maintenance um, there, it, you know, through the assessment district. So that's what all the blue represents. Then what the orange represents is, um, that's sidewalk next to the parking lot. And so we've got examples of this in the rail yard and in Brickletown where the parking's on the opposite side of the street of where the businesses are, what we would be proposing to do is to take the cost of that sidewalk maintenance and incrementally assign it to the businesses that are ultimately using the parking because the sidewalk is you know providing the access from the parking spaces ultimately to the businesses so what you see in th this wouldn't be built right now so that wouldn't come into play immediately but it could in the future this would be built now so uh, as a business owner you know, and we as the town is, you know, we would be all proportionately sharing in the cost of that. So, and then what you see in green here, that's the landscaping on the perimeter of the parking lot. It costs less to maintain because you don't have sidewalks and landscaping and all that, but there's, there's a cost there. So the notion is that that would be uh, also uh, proportionately shared by the property owners. So that's the same model that exists in the rail yard. So in the rail yard, uh, there's a bunch of parking lots on the south side of the road, and then there's uh, sidewalks between those parking lots and the street. So the way the sidewalk maintenance gets paid for is basically by the property owners on the north side of the road. Same in Brickletown. So on the, in Brickletown, there's that row of angle parking that's on the south side of the road. Uh, there's the, the band sculpture that kind of runs, it's near that. Uh, so the cost of that sidewalk maintenance is proportionately shared by the property owners on the north side of the road and then a couple, you know, Mountain Home Center and those folks as well. So this is proposed to be that same model that exists in some of those other areas. Um, yeah, we just talked about the yeah, the areas it would be the town responsibility, and then the property owner responsibility. Uh, again, it's the area directly in front of your sidewalk, and or uh, in front of your property, and then the uh, the proportionate share of the sidewalks that serve the parking. Um, so when we last met about this about a year ago, uh, we had identified that it was going to be around two and a half bucks a square foot of uh, or of sidewalk square footage in front of your property is what the assessment amount would be. That's still what we see the numbers uh, being, so that hasn't changed. Um, when you do the math on it, between the property that the town owns and then these areas of no man land, no man's land, the town would end up paying for about 40 plus percent of the maintenance out here, and then the property owners would be paying just under 60% total cost when we reported this last time was eighty three thousand dollars that was like three years ago when we put the numbers together things have happened since then uh, things have gotten more expensive so now that estimates more like 97 K total uh, all properties would be the same rate so the cost per square foot in front of one parcel would be the same as as another the assessments would go into effect after the sidewalks are built so you know, we had this. We had this somewhere. It was on one of those other projects where, oh, it's, I think it was Brickletown, where we had built some of the sidewalk, but not all of it. So, like in year one, the properties that had sidewalk in front of them got assessed. The ones that didn't uh, weren't assessed until the subsequent year when the sidewalks got built. So it kind of phases in as the infrastructure gets built. Um, Oh, and there would be a CPI adjustment on it just to keep up 
with inflation as time goes on. So that's that's the basic concept there. I know we've we've talked about this in the past, um, and really nothing's changed from the town's perspective on that. I know there's been some property owners like, eh, yeah, I'm conceptually okay with it. Others others may not be. Ultimately, that's what the vote process is for. Yes. My brain's getting tired. So if you're a homeowner and you live in your house, you're paying the same amount as, let's say, but where you have a lot of customers coming in utilizing more spaces. I know you're uh, going uh, by the same amount, but I'm just, sorry. just trying to think from perspective yeah, of, you know, that's it just kind of reminds me. That one's working. Um, so yeah, you, you, what we did in Brickletown is we actually, we did have a accommodation for the residential property owners, there were like three or four of them, where they did pay a lower rate until, or until they, if the property turned over. So if it was commercial, it was commercial. We didn't try to differentiate between uh, a flooring business and a restaurant. It was either commercial or residential. But for properties that were just a full-time home, we actually did assess those at a lower rate with a provision that if they switched to a commercial use, that then the rate would, would go up to the same rate everyone else was paying. So that's something we could look at here. I'm trying to remember if we have any just single exclusive residential that was a different Homes. mechanism that we used for Oh, we used the CFD. District. That's right. So it was a different legal mechanism. What's that? So we, we would need to look at that with our assessment district engineer to see if th these, there's like three or four ways you can do these things. And each one of them has their own set of rules. And depending on which mechanism you're using, you've got different flexibility and what Jessica just reminded me of is we use this thing called the CFD which had more flexibility in terms of the taxing structure. The landscape lighting district that we're structure I think is more rigid right so that could be an issue. Is there a way to raise the parking so they can all pay for it who comes here? The, Can we raise the cost of parking across the board to cover all these funds for all of us during the past couple of years of very difficult time? I suppose. You know, that's another so policy that's issue. issue. What's that? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, they're coming to use the parking, and they're coming here. 
Yeah, I think, the, well, they're coming to you, coming to frequent the businesses and then using the parking as a means to do that. So our higher parking rates, um, so like get rid of the maintenance districts and, and spin off more money from parking, that I suppose could be an option. That's not, not the one that's been used so far. Technically, the parking um, meter uses that more for like the actual structural projects than not so much the assessment part. Is that how parking is in the past or what? Its purpose is for is for future actual projects, but not the maintenance of them. So the the parking revenue uh, up to this point has funded uh, the ongoing operation of the parking, snow removal, striping, paving, sealing, enforcement, and then it's also, in this case, funded the purchase of that land right. to provide the ability to add parking should it be needed in the future. So those are the types of things that that money has been used for uh, to date. Well, as it re it's always related to some type of parking. To date, that's been the case, yep. But it's not been used for uh, the maintenance or clearing. That part of it is passed on to, the, so far has been passed on to the property. The maintenance and clearing of the sidewalks, the maintenance and clearing of the parking lots and the on-street parking, that's funded by the parking district. But the area in front of the... The sidewalk area is what is, is the property owners have paid for. What's the annual estimated revenue of the new Mill Street parking that you've got there? Do you have the number on that? Right now it's zero because it's a vacant right. lot Once still. you put it together, you obviously have a number on it. What's the estimated annual revenue of the parking at Jack's with these new spaces yeah. going at, do you know? Uh, I would expect it's going to be similar to the current revenue on West River Street because most of the West River Street parking is currently paid parking and we're going to end up with the same number of spaces so they get moved around and I think between Jack's and the West River Street spots I think it's like thirty-five or 40,000 a year was uh, my which recollection. That. What's that? Which is nothing for that, which is very minimal. Um, well, I propose you raise the rates. So all, the all right. Uh, so you you heard it here first, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm, I guess what I was asking is, you know, if there's flexibility in it just being a, a vote versus it just being yes or no. I want this, but room for, like I said, a proportion, a, a percentage of that parking can go towards. Um, lowering the assessment rate or I'm just I, 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 no 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 I think I follow what you're saying and I, I think at the end of the day anything's possible I think it uh, ends up being a bigger conversation than just West River Street though oh, everybody yeah everybody because you know that the conversation's happening not just here mm -hmm. it's happening in all the districts it's been the conversation yeah. uh, Joe yeah two questions then it uh, seems to me when we did our major remodel on that building that we paid a parking bond. I think you paid a park, I suspect it may have been a parking in Luffy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so does that fit into the... It, it does. So uh, what, what, so the question is um, when, you know, Joe and Shelly did a project a number of years ago, uh, I think as part of the project, it identified that there needs to be more parking. There wasn't a place to build it. So there's this program in place where you can effectively pay money into a kitty uh, instead of building the parking space. So the money in that kitty, I, you know, I said that you know, the bulk of the money came from the parking district to buy that land. Some of it actually would have come from money in that kitty as well, right? So it's this parking. It's yeah, so it's a parking in lieu fee program. The notion is you can't build the space, so you put money money in the bank, basically, to to be able to build parking at some place in the future. So yeah, so we use parking and lieu fees for some of that acquisition as well. So is any offset with those funds that were paid, or because I, I mean we had like seven parking spots and we did bicycle. We had to put a handicap up. And, and right. That's beside the point. The other thing that I think I understood is that the assessment is going to be based on square footage of sidewalk. Yes. I think we need to do a little uh, trim on that bunion you have in front of our building. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
Jets have. Right. Yeah. So and so that's that's, that's a good point. So in, in Brickletown, there were some areas where that came up, and a property owner was like, "Well, why is the sidewalk wider here or narrower I mean, I here?" Like it. Right. Good. And it and there were some areas like that where it's like, "Oh, it's for some you know to tie in a crosswalk or something." So there were what we did in Brickletown, and this is why these conversations are good as we said hey there's some areas like that that will kind of throw into that common okay. right so it's like okay that one's wider to accommodate that crosswalk and the property owner would prefer, would prefer to have a parking space there with less sidewalk but they can't so there's there's some finessing like that but it's not like it just goes away it just means that it we need to be able to justify it to everyone else in the room Absolutely. whose, yeah, whose no, house I it's mean, not in front of I right understand, I understand that it, it would probably do something to slow traffic down right. too with that Right. Bump up, you know, so. and it, um, Shades of parking. Curb line in and, and, and some uh, parallel parking, right? So it's kind of a... I just thought it was an oddity when I saw it. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to fit it in because it's, um, it's not a regular street. I'll fit it in when I write the check. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, so Jessica, I, th I think, so there's a project website, the we we didn't actually list it because it, it's, too you, long. You, it's too long but <laughs> if you google west river streetscape trucky yeah. Yeah. it'll so. get you to the project website and i believe there's a table in there that identifies all the different property owners or maybe it's an exhibit there will be so all the stuff that we have out today will get put on that website and once it's all up on there, I'll send out another email to you guys. Yeah, so, so I'm sure folks in the room are like, okay, these guys aren't telling me exactly how much is my number. Yeah, right. uh, uh, so to get to get that right now, what you could do is you can go to the website or you can look at these exhibits, look at what that square footage number is in front of your property and multiply by 2.43 and that, that's gonna get you right in the ballpark in terms of what, what that, um, what that assessment would end up being. Six foot wide by length unless you have more space? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so the number should be on that map that has the, the color coding and stuff, so the, you can take a look at that as far as square footage. And, and let us know if they're wrong, too. I mean, sometimes people are like, oh, this is our... A lot of plans here that are, if you really want to hone in on what, what things are looking like in front of your property. I also have some blow-ups of um, some of the areas that I'll probably be contacting you guys about soon is their, their transition areas. Right, I was going to ask for elevation. Yeah, so um, if you have want to talk to me about that, come by. And then there's some other areas that aren't like, yours is fairly straightforward because it goes in the driveway, so we're not going to leave drop-offs. We have a couple of... We have two elevations. We can discuss that privately. I don't want to take any of more time. Okay. But, um, like, Jim, we have probably some questions on how we want to transition your areas and um, things like that. So, um, who else was in here? I think um, those guys over there. Well, thanks a lot.